User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at Ugtastic.com. Hi, it's Mike with Ugtastic. I'm here at SCNA 2013. I'm sitting down with Dave Thomas. Uh, you might know him as Prag Dave on Twitters. Uh, and you're also you're the founder of uh, the Pragmatic Publishers, am I correct? Along with Andy Hunt, and uh, Pragmatic Programmers, Pragmatic Bookshelf. Yeah. Yes, and um, he gave a talk, uh, Dave gave a talk called Unknown Knowns. Uh, so thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with me. Um, I appreciate it. Unknown Knowns, that's, that's very, uh, that's very uh, philosophical, almost very meta. Um, it's what, also hard to mean? remember. Yes, Unknown <laughs> Knowns. So, I mean, the, the inspiration, if you like, for the title came from Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, he gave a, a press conference back in 2002 where he uh, talked about known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns uh, when he was talking about you know, the uh, hunt for weapons of mass destruction. And um, he left off uh, the idea of unknown knowns. That is, things that are known, but you don't know that you know them. Right. Um, and that to me is a really important concept because the reality is that's most of our knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, most of our knowledge, the ability to do just about anything we do, talk for example, um, is really buried way deep down below our conscious level. Mm -hmm. And so that's an unknown known. And the reality is if you want to do something proficiently, um, perhaps surprisingly, you have to do it um, without conscious thought, or without conscious intervention, I guess is more accurate. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you become proficient at doing things through intuition? And there's a fair amount of research on exactly how you can do that, like and blink? what I want to present. Like Blink, would that be an example of? Blink is, is along that lines. Blink is the idea of the um, using your intuition. And mm -hmm. I think Blink is good at a um, at a high level. Mm -hmm. And it certainly makes a good strong point for using intuition. I think Blink um, is a little bit simplistic, probably because it's a mass market book and everything right. else. But it, it, the idea of like the five second decision and all this kind of stuff, it's, it's not a bad idea, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it can also lead you quite, uh, it can lead you to be quite lazy. The reality is that intuition, there are, there's a process to gain intuition. Uh, you don't just say, oh, I'm an intuitive person, you know, and therefore I'll make decisions without research. Uh, the reality is that to, um, to get to the point where you can make intuitive decisions, you first have to go through the work of learning all the stuff that you're going to be deciding about. Uh, and only after you've learned that and internalized that uh, are you then in a position to, to make those intuitive decisions. Yeah. So, you know, for example, a baby learning to talk is not going to um, uh, learn words or sentences first. They're going to learn sounds, mm -hmm. and then they're going to internalize those sounds, get to the point where they can make them when they need to, and only then can they then start learning words. Right, and then they start getting that feedback cycle. Exactly. The, oh, when I said, yeah, Daddy got really excited. You know? Right, and that's, <laughs> I mean, that's how we learn meaning. We right. learn meaning not by being told that you know, this object is Daddy. It's, it's by having that feedback, that tacit feedback, and that's a a really big part of this learning theory is that you learn things um, subconsciously by looking at the um, response that happens when, when certain stimuli occur. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if uh, you can associate um, pain with touching a stove, for example, then you're going to avoid heat in all circumstances, no, sometimes without even thinking about it. Right? And that's the kind of thing we're talking about. I think uh, what all, um, there's a few things that came to mind listening to your talk. And uh, I'm a parent, I have three children, and I'm going through, my youngest is, is nine months, and uh, she's nine months old. Um, and uh, watching the, th you know, the three children as, they're, as their emergent consciousness are starting to try to figure out things that I take for granted. For example, my five-year-old is learning how to spell. And we're sitting down and she was creating a, a list for me of my, my checklist to pack for the conference. And very sweet, she's like, all right, Daddy, we had to make a list. So she, kn right. so she knows that there's a list and it's important. And I'm, she says, well, what do we need? And I said, okay, we need a computer. What does she write? K. Right. And okay, K, well, that, that one has a C. And, and I, that when we sit down to write 
And I felt so bad because she ran into C, the F, PH, because we, we had to have a computer, a microphone, and a suitcase. So poor thing had a K for right. the computer, an F for the, the microphone, and uh, uh, the OO sound, she wanted to write S-O-O for suitcase. Right. Uh, but Quite we, reasonably, yeah, too. Yeah, reasonably. Yeah. And that's when you're able to teach, and that's why I, I really appreciate your talk uh, later when you mentioned about going to the user groups and teaching, that's when we're in these situations where we are just living our tacit state, where we're just kind of complacently in our own thoughts and our own day-to-day -day experience, working through the machinery that we've built up in our minds, we don't think about those things that have just become rote. And then when you go back and you teach somebody who is completely naive to the entire concept of spelling or the entire concept of programming, that breaks you out of your your little bubble. It's like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. I think one of the things that I love to do, um, and I don't get to do enough of, is uh, pair program to teach people um, a programming language. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to do that a lot with Ruby. So if someone would say, I want to learn Ruby, so uh, we'd sit down just for an hour, and they would drive, and mm -hmm. we'd program Ruby. And the reason I loved it is because they would, you know, I would say, well, actually, that's probably not the way we do that. We do it. And they'll say, why? Right. And it forces you to re-examine all of these, like, habits that mm -hmm. you get into. And to, you know, dig back into that conscious side to work out why things go on. But to your point, though, when you're talking about being, you know, sort of happily oblivious in your, in your tacit state, I think that's actually one of the big uh, mistakes that people make is they get to a point where they can live life um, tacitly. And that's, that's easier than having to think about everything all the time, right? Yeah. So you kind of like start getting onto autopilot. And it's not just in terms of career, your autopilot in terms of uh, your, your rest of your life as well. You know, your, your, maybe even your family or relationships, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of like it's all handled for you somewhere in your subconscious. Um, and I think that that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very dangerous to become stale. Sounds very boring too. Well, it's boring, um, but I think you could also miss uh, so much. So one of the things I think that's really key is to um, always start, always to build on those tacit layers that you mm -hmm. have. Um, and one of the th one of the theories about this tacit learning is that you have to learn it in layers. So in the same way that babies learn sounds, then words, then sentences, you know, we're learning. Um, programming languages or whatever else, techniques, whatever that works for us. Um, these are all layered. And so once you have one layer mastered, mm -hmm. you owe it to yourself to then to go to the next layer, to push and build on that. So maybe you've learned a programming language. Okay, so now learn how to do certain things with that language or learn how to use certain libraries in language. Once you've got that nailed, go off and look at different problem domains or learn a new language or whatever it might be. But always keep learning. Um, it's interesting, my, uh, my wife and I travel to China a lot, and so she decided uh, last year, Christmas time, that she wanted to learn Mandarin. Mm -hmm. So she started to learn, she's doing really well. Um, and obviously the pressure has been on me to do the same. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, my, my brain is really bad at hearing sounds or differentiating sounds. Um, and so it's very, very hard for me to uh, listen to Mandarin and then try to reproduce it. Um, and it's been very uh, interesting and humiliating for me uh, to go back to being a beginner speaking. Um, right. And it's in a way, it's actually been very fun because what it's done is it's kind of like um, reminded my brain how to be a beginner again. Mm -hmm. And I found that in some ways that's kind of freed me up on the programming side as well. Right. Um, and it's interesting you say that about, I, I, I have members of my family who are from Europe and their English is by far their second language. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we've had discussions about uh, Polish and, and English and, and trying to get them to explain why is the lamp female. Right. <laughs> yeah. It just is. And then, uh, but then again, we, why is why is microphone spelled with ph and all that? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's just things that we've tacitly accepted. We just that's just the way it is. It just it right. is. But um, it, it also reminds me that when you're the beginner, sometimes 
when you're one of the scary things, and I think one of the scariest things for people when they're when they're looking at learning something new or making a, a massive career change. Like a few years ago, I went from being a .NET developer on a Microsoft platform to being a Ruby developer with a Mac and you know a terminal. And I went from being competent in being able to be strong and and just come in and execute on the problem to I don't know what how to change directories. You know, right, I right, mean, right. like I'm not quite yeah. a, but I, yeah. you know, how do I clear the screen? I don't know. And um, it's incredibly humbling where you're completely hobbled. And then if you're able to even take a further step back and look at that and say, well, how are other people sometimes hobbled? Thinking about the people who, uh, you know, like an immigrant who was uh, uh, coming to America and is driving a taxi here, but was a doctor back home. You know, for whatever reason, they've chosen that, you know, this this path or were forced on this path, but you, you never know where somebody's been in, in a humbled state themselves. So mm. it, it can be a, a, a key t a step towards empathy by becoming a learner and completely stripping yourself down almost to the bare bones and, and then feeling that pain and then being able to look at somebody else and try to reflect that in them. Yeah, but there's another side to that too. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right. But the, um, again, the theory says that um, beginners at things uh, require guidance. Mm -hmm. right? It's not just you know, they get it wrong if they don't have guidance. They actually require it in order to learn. Um, they need to have context-free uh, instruction. Mm -hmm. right? So whereas um, an expert or even someone who's got moderate experience um, would be able to fill in all the gaps and you know, understand that, okay, you said this, but it doesn't really occur in this circumstance or whatever else. For a beginner, you have to be very directive. Mm -hmm. And you kind of like get out of the habit of directing people. I mean, you do it a little bit with little kids because, again, they're beginners at things. Right. You know? um, but really, you feel bad or you feel like you're being rude, telling people, do this, then do that, then do the mm -hmm. other. The reality is, if you're dealing with a beginner, that's exactly what you should do. It doesn't matter if they're nine months old or 90 years old. If they're a beginner, they need to be told. I mean, if, if, if you're learning to parachute, right, you really don't care about the physics of, or the aerodynamics of the shoe or anything else. You just want to be told what to pull and when. Yeah. Right? That's the sum yeah. total of yeah. what you want. You want rules. Yeah? And that's what beginners need. Mm -hmm. And so although, yes, the empathy side is important, I think it's also important to understand how to interact with people as they're learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and the interesting thing about that is it implies that your interaction style is going to change over time. It's going to start off being very directive, but as they get experience, it's going to become more and more collegial. Right. You know? uh, and so I think you can see the good managers are people that do that instinctively, mm -hmm. who are directive at one, one day, and then six months later, they're sort of a bit more back slappy, kind of like, you know, oh, you know how to go do that, go do that. Right, right, yeah. And, um, in your talk, you talked. To, uh, you described the Donald Rumsfeld quote that probably every American has heard already. Um, but uh, about the uh, you know things that we know that we uh, you, you can look it up. Uh, but uh, the um, that that quote though, you said there was one aspect missing. Right. And that was the unknown knowns. And I just wanted to to say that there was. It, it made me think about this quote uh, that. What, I don't know if, if it's ever been established that uh, uh, Donald Rumsfeld was quoting this, but there's an old, uh, or at least I, it's attributed to it as an old Arabic paraphrase, but I really enjoyed it, um, excuse me, uh, proverb, and it was that he that knows and knows not that he knows is asleep waking. And that just makes me think about what you were just saying about being on autopilot and trying to find somebody who can wake you and question what you yeah but you know I think that's part of it but it's and yeah you're absolutely right um, and that's part of the larger feedback loop which is don't get complacent you know make sure you're still conscious of what you're doing but on a day-to-day -day level being um, in that state of not knowing is actually the most important thing right if I was to throw a ball and you were to try and catch it by thinking about, I have to catch this ball. So let's think, where's it gonna come down? Um, probably over here, I gotta move my hand like this and then open my fingers up. And if you try to do that, the ball will be on the ground long before you'd even got the hand out, right? right? Because you have to 
at the conscious level, you're just too slow, right? Mm -hmm. But if I said to you, how do you catch a ball? You wouldn't be able to tell me, you know? Mm -hmm. Baseball players' entire career is based on being able to do something they cannot tell you how they do it. Mm -hmm. it it's, and people have tried to study how they do it. And there's like little tricks that they do do, like try and keep a constant angle on the descent and this kind of stuff. But it's very, very difficult to describe. Um, and the thing that I try to get across to developers is that's a good state to be in, right? Getting to the point where you operate, autopilot is maybe not quite the right word for it, but where you can operate instinctively means that you can be coding and another part of your brain, the conscious part of your brain, is looking at yourself coding. Mm -hmm. And it's that looking at yourself is giving you the feedback to, to do it better. Right. Right? And fine tune things. So I'm not saying that you got a, in, you become an intuitive coder and at that point it all freezes and you're an expert and you know, mm -hmm. people genuflect. What happens is that you get to that level and now you finally have the ability to improve yourself by monitoring yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, you're, bla you're, you're now using two parts of your brain, the intuitive part, which is kind of subconscious, below the level of conscious, and then the conscious part can look at what you're doing right. and say, hey, you know what, in the future I could do this differently, and then try to train the subconscious part to do that. And that's exactly the same process. You're going to train it by repetition, by reminding yourself to do this, by giving yourself feedback. You know? mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's, yeah, it's good to reevaluate and to never to do everything just on autopilot the whole time. Right. Um, at the same time, you have to accept that the only way to be effective uh, in any real world activity is through this tacit knowledge. Yeah. And it, so in a way, it's, it's, it's a very uh, programming your brain that you, like we sit down and we, we write code that it automatically goes and runs. But we, we do some thought so that way it can do that. And then we train ourselves to do a certain activity so that way we can just let it go sometimes and just let that automation yeah, to an extent. I don't think it's quite that scientific. Mm -hmm. um, it's closer to um, learning to drive a car, for mm -hmm. example. I mean, when you first learn to drive a car, you're a white knuckle, clenching the wheel. You are, you know, there's too much going on. It's simplified down to, you know, a couple of pedals and a steering wheel and that's it, right? right. And if, if someone says, watch out for that pedestrian going over there, I mean, you freak out because you can't think about that pedestrian, you're still too busy steering and everything else. Right. Um, and after a while, as that experience starts to build, gradually the number of factors that you can take into account grows. Um, and I think it's the same. I, I learned to fly a, a plane and amazingly, uh, you can actually solo, typically most people will solo a plane after about five or six hours instruction. Mm -hmm. And that's a really wild thing. I mean, you, f you fly around a little bit and then you know, at some point your instructor lands you, gets out of the plane and says, okay, go do a, do a circuit. And you do that circuit and it is the most tiring thing you've done in your <laughs> life, I can guarantee, because you are thinking constantly. I mean, you, there's no spare neuron. Everything is thinking and probably about your adrenaline level. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's like, you know, I have to do this, I have to do this, remember to do this, blah, 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 you know. And it's like, it's a miracle anyone survives it, but everybody does. Man, right? um, then you don't get your license for probably another 50 hours. Mm -hmm. And that 50 hours is spent doing these things over and over again and getting to the point where you can sit back and look at the bigger picture. Um, and it keeps going. I mean, airlines hire pilots with 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. um, you know, senior pilots go up 20 or 25,000. And that's because they have basically, they've seen it all, but not just that, they've internalized it all. Um, and interestingly, the best pilots uh, are the ones who don't necessarily follow the rules. Mm -hmm. They write the rules, but they don't have to follow them. Well, yeah, if you can write the rules, then the, you, you, you've already established yourself at a certain level where you're starting to think beyond the rules. Well, and you, you can deal with situations where the rules no longer apply. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a famous case of a pilot, uh, it was a U.S. Airways pilot, um, what's his name now? Al something or other. And he was uh, flying cross country and he, uh, the uh, engine in the tail blew up. And that's in theory not a big deal because you have two other engines and the plane was just flying. Unfortunately, this particular blob sent fan blades 
through all of the hydraulic lines, or sorry, hydraulic lines for all of the hydraulic systems. Mm -hmm. So there are three hydraulic systems at a minimum on a plane. This actually disabled all of them. So he had no hydraulics. So that's literally the worst case scenario. Yeah, and he could not control any of the control surfaces on the plane. Mm -hmm. There was no manual control. So the plane was basically unflyable. According to the book, nothing he could do. But he had, you know, 25,000 hours or something. He happened to be flying with another instructor pilot on the, in the jump seat, and his co-pilot was very experienced. And between them, they worked out a brand new way of flying airplanes using the throttles. And um, they did that, the rule books did not apply. I mean, none of the manuals, I mean, basically, if you open the, the everybody, every plane has something called a pilot operating handbook, which is kind of like instructions, right? And if you go to the red tab, which is emergencies, and look for total hydraulic failure, it basically says, kiss your ass goodbye. Right. You know? Have you brought a parachute? Yeah. yeah. Right. And they basically didn't even bother. They just said, okay, we'll work this out. And they worked out, and they got this thing, and they landed the plane at Sioux City, Iowa, mm -hmm. simply using the throttles. Um, and they saved, I don't know how many hundred lives. I mean, there was a crash, because at some point, you have to turn the throttles back to land. Right. And at that point, they lost control of the plane. But they managed to get the thing down on the ground which is stunning. And that's only because they had the experience and the intuition to be able to predict or to be able to, yeah, initially predict and then learn very quickly how the plane reacts when it's flown in a totally unique kind of way. And, you know, just coming towards the end, but uh, I'm thinking about the, 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 um, what, the, the levels of mastery and that sometimes when you get to a certain level of mastery, it's hard for maybe what you might call a lay person to be evaluate the difference between mm -hmm. different levels of mastery. And um, I'm thinking about, I, I went and, and saw a dance performance and I just thought it was beautiful, but then I heard the person who was a dancer next to me saying, well, that person over there wasn't totally with it. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I've watched, uh, I, you wouldn't know by this, but I used to skateboard extensively and now when I watch videos of, of skateboarders I can tell like oh my god that person is amazing like what they're doing and then others ah, oh, he's you know he's just doing rudimentary stuff yeah sure it's big but it's 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 very common stuff and in programming sometimes I think uh, because what we do is so much um, um, in our head and then into code and then really the interface that you can have with that is it's very limited it's hard to tell when you're looking at um, at, uh, at books or at, at open source code or or at another program and trying to evaluate where they stand um, as, as as far as professionals, do you have have you put any thought into how you evaluate what is what is good? And this is kind of reflecting on a on a panel talk you uh, participated in earlier, but towards what is what is the metric for being able to evaluate whether or not either another individual programmer is, is competent and is what their level of mastery is. So when you're sitting down to teach somebody or looking at somebody who's going to be working with you, you, know, you kind of have to have that, like, okay, where do they stand in, in, mm. in a continuum? Do you, have, you, have you ever thought about how you uh, uh, look at somebody and evaluate their, their skill level? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I've got to say that I am possibly the world's worst recruiter. Um, I have a, a habit of either recruiting perfect people for the job or absolutely, you know, the devil incarnate. It, it's like one or the other, I can't hit the middle point. Um, kind of like the maniac. It's, yeah, kind of like that. But it's, it's just like, I don't know why it is, but I, I, I maybe I just trust my intuition too much. Um, but I think there's a couple of things you can look for, um, particularly face-to-face -face if you talk to somebody. Um, one, and it, it's, not, it's not binary, there's a combination of factors. One thing I look at is how they respond to mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, if you are a beginner, uh, then a mistake is like a, a serious thing, right? Mm -hmm. they, they panic, they, oh, you know, it's, I've made a mistake and they apologize or whatever else. If you are more advanced, then you realize that mistakes happen and you're just going to have to fix it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, a more advanced person would just kind of laugh it off and get on and fix it. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you know, comment on how it happened, why it happened, and how you'd stop it happening again, you know? Um, 
Similarly, the more advanced people are capable of doing more than one thing at the same time. So as they're coding, they may be talking to you, mm-hmm. you know, and ideally giving a commentary on what they're doing. Um, and so I look for that a little bit. You know, can I sit there and chat while they're coding or whatever else? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think those are the kind of external indicators. Um, you can also look at the code and mm-hmm. see, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's one of these, I know it when I see it things, right. but it's good code has a kind of simplicity, a kind of cleanliness, uh, a structure, and small things. Like good developers, I think, my experience is that good developers will care more about not just the logic of the code, but also the presentation of the code. Mm-hmm. You know, they like producing things that look nice. Um, and there's good reasons for it, but it's typically a kind of like third order effect. So you only start seeing that with the more experienced people. I don't have an exact answer, but okay. I mean, those are the kind of things that I'm, I'm hoping to see. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much for taking well, the time to sit down with me. I no, really thank appreciate you. it. I really appreciate the opportunity. Okay. User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com.